Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about transistor amplifiers and specifically I want to look at methods to set the DC bias point using passive circuits. Since there are multiple types of transistors out there, each having their specific behaviors, I will be looking at bipolar transistors only today. I will not be looking at how the signal is passing through the circuit, but rather I will strictly focus on the biasing. Now, even though nowadays we have all sorts of specialized amplifying elements available like op amps, single transistor amplifier blocks are still widely used when it comes to very low noise circuits or when very high frequencies are involved. So if you're interested in making a good radio frequency signal amplifier, you might consider building it with discrete transistors. And the first step of course in any amplifier design is setting the bias point. So if you're curious, then keep watching. When it comes to amplifiers, the DC bias point, or operating point, or Q quiescent point, refers to the state in which the transistor is kept when there is no signal being applied, so when it's not amplifying anything. Once a signal is applied, the voltages and currents will start to oscillate around the bias point. Now ideally, you want to have as much room as possible for the signal to swing around the bias point so that you minimize distortion and ensure a large output signal amplitude. Once your operating class is selected, determining the ideal bias point can be done in multiple ways. One common method involves the use of the graphs present in the transistor's datasheet to determine a load line and the bias point being somewhere on this line, but in some radio frequency transistor datasheets, you no longer have these graphs available. Rather, they suggest some optimum values around which the transistor is already characterized. Regardless of the method by which you determine the bias point, which is a set of values comprising of the collector current and collector emitter voltage, once you have it, you need to implement it. And the hard bit about that is to keep the transistor close to the bias point under all conditions. So for today, I have the following set of values that I will be trying to implement. So I will be using a supply voltage of 10 volts, and I want to set a bias point comprised of a collector emitter voltage of 5 volts and a collector current of 50 milliamps. So these are just some generic values. And as test transistor, I will be using the BC847, which has a DC gain somewhere in the range of 110 to 800, based on the gain group from which it is selected, but we will be using 160 for our calculations. So how hard can it be? And the first method to look at, which is the only one that is not recommended at all, is fixed biasing. So to get a specific collector current running through the transistor, you need to provide a specific current going through the base. And based on the gain factor of the transistor, the collector current will be the base current times this gain factor. So this sounds simple enough. So to set a specific base current, we can use a base resistor, so R1 in our case. And based on the collector current, we can set a specific collector emitter voltage by dropping the rest of the supply voltage on the collector resistor. And based on some formulas I found, I came up with these component values to implement this circuit. Now, in most formulas, there is some degree of approximation, so the values might not be the final ones that you will end up using, but they are a good start. So let's try these out. So to show off today's circuits, I will be using a circuit simulator. LD Spice, of course. And just to make sure that the circuits that we're simulating are actually stable, I will be simulating two different transistors. So these are coming from the LT Spice library, and the two transistors have different gain factors. So this is perfectly normal with real life transistors, so you won't get two perfectly identical ones. And other than the gain, I will be simulating multiple temperatures. So minus 20 and plus 80 degrees. And I will be only simulating a DC operating point, since we're not really interested in any sort of AC or time domain behavior. And to compare the results, I also set some target values so we have the 5 volt target collector emitter voltage that we want to get, and we have the target collector current. So when you get 5 volts running through 100 ohms, you should be getting 50 milliamps. So now if we run the circuit, and we look at the two collector currents, and compare them to what we should be getting, and at the same time we also look at the collector emitter voltages and what we should be getting, we see that in both cases we have quite a large spread of values. So our collector emitter voltage in the upper window is going from 
about 5.7 volts down to 0.5, so a huge spread in collector emitter voltage. And the collector current is also running over quite a wide spread, so up to about 95 milliamps and down to 42. So we're getting quite a large variation in response. But why is that? Well, to get a better answer to this question, it's time to look into a transistor datasheet. So this is the datasheet for our BC847. And first of all, based on the gain group from which the transistor is being taken, the DC gain will have a 1 to 2 variation with the gain, and this can be even higher with different transistors. But it's also important to observe that the DC gain isn't just, well, transistor dependent, it's also temperature and collector current dependent. So the hotter the transistor is, the higher the gain is. So if you have some power being dissipated on your transistor, it will heat up, the gain will rise, then the transistor will heat up even more, so you do get a chance of running into a thermal runaway situation, which is not something good. In a similar fashion, the base emitter voltage is also not a constant, it's temperature dependent. So as the transistor heats up, you will need less and less base emitter voltage. So if you keep this parameter constant, the current will rise again, which will also lead to the transistor heating up. So the circuit needed to set the bias point ideally needs to minimize the impact of the transistor's non-constant parameters the beta factor and the base emitter voltage, as much as possible to keep things stable. Let's now see how we can improve on the fixed bias method. Well, in short, we need to provide negative feedback one way or another. So to start off, I have here two very similar schematics. One gets its feedback from the collector and the other from the emitter. The idea here being that the collector current and the base current are running through a common component the feedback component. And as collector current rises, the voltage on this component also rises, so the voltage available to drive the base will be decreasing, therefore the base current will be decreasing. So this is how we implement the negative feedback mechanism. Higher collector current means lower base current. As long as you're not adding any other components to the circuit, the two resistors can be calculated in the exact same way for both circuits. It's also important to observe that these circuits will be more stable the larger the voltage drop on the feedback resistor is. So this is important to keep in mind when we do need to add some other components. So I determined a set of values to set the same operating point and before moving forward it is time to test this circuit out. So now I prepared these two circuits in the simulator and we also have the previous circuit just to compare them to. So if we first of all look at the collector currents in the two circuits and compare the two arrangements, we can see that they are identical, so it's the same circuit, just the components are put into different places. So we'll just look at the collector feedback circuit. And now if we compare the response of this circuit to our initial circuit, so we can see we are doing much better. So blue and green Q4 and Q2 are the ones with the collector feedback resistor and Q3 and Q1 are the ones with the fixed bias. In a similar fashion, if we now look at the collector emitter voltage, so first of all on the circuits with feedback, and then on the two initial circuits, again we see that we are much closer to what we're supposed to be getting. So we're on the right track. Negative feedback is good feedback. Now, coming back to the circuit with the emitter resistor, Sometimes you will want to have a resistor also in the collector. So this might be your output load in some cases. So now, to keep the same collector emitter voltage as before, you need to reduce the voltage available on the emitter resistor, the resistor which is providing the feedback. Now, although the added collector resistor will be needed for functional reasons, because of the smaller voltage present on the emitter resistor, you will have a smaller amount of feedback and consequently a less stable circuit. And to test this out, I recalculated the three components for the situation in which we want to have 4 volts dropping on our collector resistor and 1 volt dropping on our emitter resistor. So we got a new set of values and it's time to test these out in the simulator again. So now I included this circuit also into the simulator and we can compare it to our previous circuit with the emitter resistor. And if we quickly have a look, so these are the collector currents for the transistors that also have a collector resistor and a small emitter resistor. And if we compare them to the previous example, 
we see that we are getting a wider spread. So blue Q8 and green Q7 are the transistors that have only 20 ohms in their emitter. But even as it is, if we compare them to our very first circuit, we still are doing better. So by having a smaller resistor, we are getting smaller feedback, but it's better than no feedback. Now, the next best thing to do is to try to stabilize the circuit even more by an added resistor. So to form a divider to supply the base voltage. Now, in previous circuits, the base current was dependent on the base resistor and whatever voltage was supplying it. The issue with this is that if you have a small beta, you need larger base currents, but you can't get it because it's limited by the base resistor. So the way around this is to create a divider that has more current running through it than the base actually needs. Typical value is 10 times more. So when the base does need extra current, there is a place to get it from. If it's not needed, then it will just go through the bottom side resistor. This approach can of course be applied on both the circuit with the negative feedback coming from the emitter resistor, as well as the circuit with the feedback coming from the collector resistor. So I went ahead and calculated a new set of component values to set the same operating point as before, and to keep the two circuits comparable, for the circuit with the emitter resistor, I set a voltage drop on the collector resistor of 0 volts. So now let's try these two circuits out in the simulator. So now I included the latest circuits that we've worked on, and if we quickly have a look, so first of all on the collector feedback circuit, we can see we have a very small spread in collector current, so only a few milliamps, which is way better than what we were getting with the previous collector feedback circuit. So we have a smaller spread this time in collector currents. And if we now look at the emitter feedback circuits, again, a similar story, only with the emitter feedback circuit, we are getting much, much tighter results. So this circuit seems to be working even better than the circuit with the collector feedback. So adding the extra resistor into the transistor's base to form a resistor divider is making a substantial improvement in the DC stability of the circuit. So is this a circuit that we should be using in general? Well, it's important to observe that if you're using one of the resistor divider circuits and you're injecting your useful AC signal through the base of the transistor, part of the input signal will be going through the resistor divider. So if no other measures are being taken, of course. So even though this is the best choice from a DC stability point of view, it's not necessarily the best choice from an AC point of view, since part of the input signal will not be actually get to be amplified. Another thing to observe is that the current used by the circuit with the resistor divider is larger. So because of the added resistor current, this can be a problem if low power consumption is important. So this is why you will sometimes see the circuit version without the extra low side resistor being used. There are of course some other circuits out there with resistors added here and there to try to improve the response of the circuit. But the four basic ones which rely on negative feedback with and without the resistor divider are the most common. Based on the specific transistor that you are using, you will require more or less stabilization. Not all transistors are the same of course, so the parameter variation might not be that bad with all of them. So this is something to keep in mind when choosing the DC stabilizing method. Now, the first step is to set the DC bias point. The second step is to actually pass some signal through the amplifier and, well, amplify it. And there is more than one way to do that, of course. But that is a topic for a different time. For now, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.